Zip Tie Domes presents The Hidden History of the Geodesic Dome A Study of How New Ideas Are Formed Part 2 The Genius of Walter Bearsfield A geodesic dome is derived from the icosahedron a spherical polyhedron with 20 sides, or faces, made from an equilateral triangle. To make a dome, the spherical icosahedron is divided in half, and each face is sub subdivided into smaller triangles in a way that produces a more spherical shape. The invention of the icosahedron began with man's interest in geometric spheres, such as these 5,000-year-old carved stone balls found in Scotland. It is believed that these carved stone balls may have been used to roll the heavy stones that were used to erect ancient observatories to study the night sky, such as Stonehenge. So we see an early connection between man's study of geometrical shapes and the study of the planets and stars. Beginning in the first century AD, men made these bronze dodecahedrons, which are a 12-sided polyhedron made from pentagons. They also made this 20-sided icosahedron, which is the foundation shape for the geodesic dome. The icosahedron was first described by Plato in his essay, The Timaeus, in 360 BC. Since the icosahedron was described first by Plato, it is called a Platonic solid. Aristotle said that Plato's discovery of the icosahedron was based on the earlier work of Pythagoras, nearly 100 years earlier. Like Plato, Pythagoras studied these geometric shapes and the heavens above him and wrote essays on how the earth was round, long before men knew otherwise. Other men, such as Leonardo da Vinci and Johannes Kepler, were interested in these spherical geometric shapes. These spherical shapes, such as this one by da Vinci, and the study of the heavens as in the case of Kepler and these spherical shapes that he drew, are somehow tied to each other, perhaps because they saw the heavens as one gigantic sphere and struggled with how it was constructed. And so Kepler and others studied these geometric shapes to understand the movements of the heavens. To help the general public understand the movement of the planets, large mechanical planetariums were built, such as the Royal Ice Isinga Planetarium, built in 1781 in the Netherlands. This planetarium is a working mechanical model of the solar system, with the planets moving around the sun using a pendulum clock mechanism. And it was the effort to build an even greater planetarium that brings us to Walter Bayersfield, the lead engineer for the Carl Zeiss Company and the inventor of the first geodesic dome. Here is how the construction of a planetarium led to the invention of the geodesic dome. In 1905, Oscar von Miller, who was the founder of the Deutsche Museum, commissioned the Zeiss Company to build a mechanical planetarium for the Deutsche Museum in Munich, Germany. This was to be the world's largest mechanical planetarium. The planets were represented by spheres that traveled on overhead rails powered by electric motors. The orbit of Saturn was 40 feet in diameter, and 180 stars were projected onto the wall by electric bulbs. The completion of this mechanical planetarium was interrupted by World War I, and so it was finally opened to the public in 1924. But this was a complicated machine to build and maintain. And it was limited in what it could do. So, during this same time, Oscar von Miller began working with the German astronomer Max Wolf, along with Walter Bayersfeld, to design and build a new type of planetarium using focused pinpoints of light created by an optical projector. This was a perfect fit for Walter Bayersfeld, who was the lead engineer for the Zeiss Company, as Zeiss at that time was the leading manufacturer of camera lenses and other optical equipment. Walter Bayersfeld designed a new type of optical projector called the Zeiss Model 1, which will be mounted centrally inside a dome-shaped building projecting points of light representing the motions of the planets and stars onto a white surface on the interior of a dome hemisphere. 
This was the world's first planetarium projector. Here is how Walter Bearsfield's design of the Zeiss Model 1 appears to be the inspiration for the world's first geodesic dome. The Zeiss Model 1 would be required to project individual points of light on the inside of a dome to represent each visible star, with other points of light representing the sun and visible planets of our solar system as they travel across the night sky in relation to the fixed positions of the stars. From this Zeiss company diagram, we see that the cylinder on the left side of the projector was designed to project the points of light to indicate the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn as they moved across the night sky in the plane of the ecliptic. The projector head on the right is the star field projector ball with each separate projector lens used to display a fixed section of the stars in the night sky. Bayersfield carefully designed the star field projector ball so that the projection fields would not overlap each other. To do this, Bayersfield used a truncated icosahedron, which is like a soccer ball, as the pattern for the placement of each projector field. A truncated icosahedron is made when the 20-sided icosahedron is truncated at each of the original 12 vertices, such that one-third of each edge is cut off. This creates 12 new pentagon faces and leaves the original 20 triangular faces as regular hexagons. Bayersfield used this pattern of hexagons and pentagons to project each section of the night sky so that the fields would not overlap. This spherical pattern based on the icosahedron is how a soccer ball is designed. And this same spherical pattern of pentagons and hexagons based on the icosahedron is also noticeable in a geodesic dome. So, when Walter Bayersfield solved the problem of how the planetarium projectors would be arranged using a pattern of a truncated icosahedron, the same icosahedron shape created the idea for the design of the world's first lightweight geodesic dome. For Bayersfield's next problem was to build a dome-shaped spherical projection screen in a building to house his planetarium. But there was no real estate or open place to build his new planetarium other than on the rooftop of the Zeiss factory in Jena, Germany. This roof had not been designed to support another building on top, which required Bayersfield to design a spherical structure made from steel that was also very lightweight. So, Bayersfield took the same shape of the icosahedron to design a projection dome, but instead of truncating the triangles, he subdivided each triangle up to 16 times, making 256 cores, or struts, for each of the original triangles in the icosahedron. And as he subdivided these triangles, he used spherical geometry to determine the correct length of each cord or strut, so that each connection point was pressed to the edge of an imaginary sphere, thus creating the world's first geodesic dome. And the world's first geodesic dome was 16 meters or 52 and a half feet wide, and assembled from 3,480 struts, accurate to two one-thousandths of an inch. Walter Bayersfield then had this dome covered with cement to provide a projection screen for his planetarium. When Walter Bayersfield received the James Watt Medal at a conference of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers in London in 1957, he described how he covered his dome. We plan to cover it first with a fine network of thin wire in order to embed the whole construction in a layer of gypsum about one and a half inches of thickness. But gypsum did not appear admirable because it could not be waterproofed, and so we inquired of an engineer of Dickerhoff and Widman, who were engaged with factory buildings of ferro-concrete for the Zeiss works, if he could not suggest a waterproof cement of viscous consistency by a hose similar to that of firefighters. If in the interior of your framework we fix to it a wooden shield of suitable spherical curvature against which we sprinkle cement in thin layers one after another, we can avoid the concrete running off the inclined surfaces. Within a few days, the cement will be stiff. We take away the shield and you get a fine, smooth surface in the interior of the dome, which is to be sprinkled by a white color to represent an ideal surface for the projection. As a result of Bayersfield's design of the world's first geodesic dome, 
On June 19, 1925, the Zeiss Company was awarded German Patent 415395, titled Process for Production of Domes and Similar Curved Structures of Reinforced Concrete. If we look carefully at this construction picture from 1924, a trained eye can tell that this is a 16 frequency icosahedron dome. Here is how we can tell the dome frequency from this picture. Geodesic domes such as this one are made from the icosahedron, a three-dimensional polyhedron with 20 triangular sides or faces. Each side or face of the icosahedron is an equilateral triangle with all the sides of the triangle having the same length. And where these original triangles or faces of the icosahedron come together, there is a five-way connection point. As you increase the dome frequency, each of the faces of the icosahedron are subdivided into smaller triangles, with these smaller triangles connected not with a five-way point, but with a six-way connection point. A six-frequency dome is created when you divide each face of an icosahedron into 36 triangles that curve outward to form a sphere with six struts along each side. But the corners of each original icosahedron face in the geodesic dome will always connect with a five-way connection point. And there are six of these connection points, one at the north pole of the dome and five located every 72 degrees around the, the dome. And if you can find two of these five-way connection points on the dome and count the number of struts between them, it will tell you the number of divisions in the edge of the original face of the icosahedron, which is the number of the frequency of the dome. This technique tells us that this is a six-frequency dome. So let's look at these pictures of the very first geodesic dome. In the first picture, we can locate a very faint five-way connection, but the angle is not sufficient to let us find a second five-way connection. The same is true for this picture. We can see one five-way connection, but not a second. In this picture, taken on the inside of the Bayersfield dome, we can find a five-way connection at the top of the dome held by the support beam and two others on the side of the dome. If we draw a line between each of these five-way connection points, we can see the triangular face of the original icosahedron. And if we count the struts between two of the five-way connection points, we can see that this is a 16-frequency geodesic dome. We can see this again on the outside of the dome in this image that was made after the first layer of concrete was applied. From this image, we can just make out two of the five-way connections. We find one five-way connection on the right, and another five-way connection on the left. By counting the 16 struts between these five-way connections, we see that this is a 16-frequency icosahedron geodesic dome. After the dome was sprayed with concrete, an outside covering was placed over the dome, and it was open to the general public in August of 1924. In this picture, you can see the rooftop geodesic dome on the right, resting on the top of the Zeiss factory in Jena, Germany in 1924. However, the incredibly large crowds of people that wanted to see the world's first projection planetarium dome required that a new and much larger dome be built immediately, away from the rooftop of the Zeiss factory. The world's first geodesic dome became obsolete and was torn down due to its own popularity. The next dome built by Zeiss was a massive 82-foot projection dome using the same technique of steel rods and reinforced concrete. This planetarium dome in Jena, Germany is still in use today. But from the original framework seen during construction, we see no five-way connections used for this dome. It is a type of lattice shell or grid shell construction designed by Walter Bayersfield as seen on Bayersfield's blueprint. And from this photograph, we can see that where the lower section of the dome meets the upper section, there are various seven-way connection points. This is not a geodesic dome based on the icosahedron. And a good point is very well made here. 
A geodesic dome that is subdivided into higher and higher frequencies is complicated and not always the best solution for building a large dome where weight is not an issue. Sometimes a standard grid shell for a large dome is a better solution than a geodesic dome design. Some uses are appropriate for a geodesic dome and some are not. And while Walter Bearsville did design the dome grid of this second Zeiss planetarium that is still in use today in Jena, Germany, the rest of the planetarium's architecture, such as, such as the doors, windows, and columns facing the street, was designed by Adolf Meyer, the very first partner and right-hand man of Walter Gropius. Adolf Meyer was a teacher of architecture at the famous Bauhaus School of Architecture that Walter Gropius founded. And it was the master architect, Walter Gropius, who oversaw Adolf Myers as he worked with Walter Bayersfield on this dome in Jena, Germany. And it was the same architect, Walter Gropius, that 24 years later was on the advisory board of Black Mountain College when Buckminster Fuller developed his geodesic dome there in 1948. Could this relationship between Walter Bayersfield and Walter Gropius to build this second planetarium dome in 1924 have been the seed of an idea that allowed Walter Gropius in 1948 to suggest to Bucky Fuller to build a geodesic dome at Black Mountain College. Could Walter Gropius be the link between the 1924 dome of Walter Bearsfield and the 1948 dome of Bucky Fuller? In the next video, which is part three of this series, let us examine the interesting life and teamwork of Walter Gropius. If you find this video interesting, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel.